Because YouTube Said So by Gary Hunt Published at the Outpost of Freedom on May 23rd, 2009 A question arises in this modern age as to whether reading is a dying art that will soon be replaced by video presentations. Is one capable of deception more than the other is? Does one provoke more thought than the other does? Is one healthier than the other is? In May of 1993, a video production by an Indiana bar attorney was making its way around the country. It was titled, Waco, the Big Lie. I use this video as an example since, though old, it was one of the first of the Patriot videos to use mass deception through this means. The video focused, primarily, on the use of a flame-throwing tank alleged to have been used by the FBI in igniting the Mount Carmel Church on fire, which resulted in the death of nearly a hundred people. As the narrator described the events, you see a tank gun barrel jam through the wall of a portion of the building. As the tank withdrew, there was a flame-colored element along the side of the tank. Along with the voice of the narrator and the footage, thousands of people became outraged that the government would use a flame-throwing tank to immolate these people in their own home. Even some of the Davidians, after watching the video, began to believe that the government had reached an extreme level of depredation by these actions. A few months later, Mike McNulty of COPS obtained the entire footage of the event. There was more footage both before and after the brief episode shown on the above-described video, which plainly demonstrated that the narration was grossly in error. Though there were many other indications of the absence of a flamethrower, the most apparent was when the apparent flame fell to the ground and bounced. If both videos were watched without the benefit of a narrator, a more honest evaluation of the events was apparent. There was no flame-throwing tank at Waco. When the narrator has a purpose or mindset, all you get from the video is the narrow channel that he is willing to give you. On the other hand, written accounts of what happened on April 19th of 1993 provide many descriptions of events that were not captured on video, and probably give the most realistic picture of what occurred, even though these accounts were also subject to the bias of the reporter. This tends to support the contention that videos might misrepresent events, leading us to false conclusions as to what really happened, more so than print or written media. Let us look at initiation of the thought process while reading and watching videos. How often, when watching a video, say, a movie, or more significantly, an informational video, do you stop and rewind the video so that you can capture or otherwise grasp what was said or presented. I know that I have done this many times. Sometimes it has gotten so frustrating that I am more willing to leave a part not understood than return and watch it again. In fact, when I am watching a video, especially an informational one, I find that I have to develop a complete reliance on the presenter. He sets the pace and I must abide by that pace. There is little, if any, time to reflect on or contemplate what was said until after the video is over. However, when reading, I set the pace. If I wish to contemplate something that was written, I simply divert my eyes and direct my mind to evaluate that subject which has grasped my attention. If I encounter something that is not quite clear in my mind, without effort, I return and reread the particular object of my concern. Moreover, as far as visualizing, well, 
I have often paused during the course of the reading to visualize the setting or event that provokes the desire to do so. I suppose that this can be compared to movies or books of the same title. A very good example is 2001 A Space Odyssey. I know that I saw the movie first. It was many months before I was able to read the book. Upon reading the book, I was, all of a sudden, able to impart meaning to many of the events that occurred in the movie that had more appearance of visual sensationalism than of comprehensive reflection of an idea. Upon watching the movie a second time, many of the confusing or not quite clear parts of the movie really made sense because the book had laid the foundation. This is true of many other books and movies that I have read or seen. To me, it is clear that much more pleasure and understanding comes from reading rather than the expedient of watching. I have watched a number of YouTube presentations on subjects dear to the Patriot community. One thing I was directed to the other day is broken into segments. I watched the first segment and listened as the guy told me what he was going to do, but he did nothing except describe, in sinister terms, an organization that was politically motivated and was seeking influence on Capitol Hill. No, it was not the NRA or even the GOA, but it was only different in its purpose and probably better funded. In another rather lengthy presentation dealing with legal status, I watched over an hour of a two-hour presentation. In all that I watched, though many legal opinions were given, not one shred of legal material was actually cited. I am left to either believe or not believe that which is presented. If I am not prone to researching to find the evidence that either supports or disproves what has been presented, I am left fully at the mercy of the person presenting the video. At this point, quite often what we accept as the truth is either something that is w well presented theatrically or says something that we wanted to hear anyway such as Waco flamethrowing tanks, for instance. At this point, many of us will have become advocates of some presentation or another. There are two reasons for this advocacy. First is that we believe what we have heard and want others to believe what we have heard. So we ask them to watch the video and believe what is heard. Then we have something in common. The second possibility is that we are not sure whether we should believe what we heard. It is easier to encourage others to watch the video and then to see if they believe what was presented, or if they find fault with it, and hopefully will bring that fault to our attention, even though we really do not want it. It is more likely that the person that we have asked to watch the video, whether they find fault with it or not, will never bring it to our attention. Why should they tend to take away from the communication between us that has developed? even if only to the extent of suggesting that they watch the video by presenting what appears to be fault within the presentation. It is better to let sleeping dogs lie. If, however, they did bring forward their concerns over the information within the video, we would, most likely, not want to talk with them anymore. After all, they challenged what we offered them, and more importantly, they challenged our belief system. We don't need them! So let us look at whether one method is, perhaps, healthier than the other is. Visitors are watched in a computer room or equivalent. Television room or movie theater. Restricted space, often less than comfortable surroundings, and at best, filtered air. Reading, however, can be conducted nearly anywhere. Outside is a nice place to read, in pleasant weather, and fresh air is at its best. Reading can be interrupted for other responsibilities and returned to at any time. It can fill in otherwise wasted time if the book is available. But probably most significantly, reading burns more than three times as many calories as watching videos. A chart at discovery.com informs me that with my 200 pounds, 
I burn 181 calories for two hours of video watching and 597 calories in two hours of reading. In this modern age where video production has become a hobby, conducted by hundreds of thousands of people and presented to even greater numbers through media such as YouTube, we have become inundated, perhaps overwhelmed, by the proliferation of information. This phenomenon has been dubbed information overload, and as a result of too, too much information, we must settle on accepting that that does not challenge what we have learned to believe, regardless of how we came to believe what we do. Sit back and reflect, however, on what the consequences might be if we accept erroneous or incorrect information. Suppose that after years of effort, things only get worse. Suppose the time finally comes when our lives depend on what we do. Do you want to stake your life on information that has not suffered a very critical review by you before you accept it as absolute truth? Is your life worth it?